Hello, this is Eddie Garcia, Senior Vice President at Healthsperian, and this is For the Health of It. For the Health of It is a weekly podcast covering all things health policy. Brought to you by Healthsperian, a nationally recognized health policy consulting firm focused on federal and state regulatory and legislative analysis, advocacy, and business strategy. On this week's episode, we take a look at grieving and how we cope during these unique and trying times. We'll hear from two thought provokers about what it means to confront our humanity and how we cope in the face of loss of loved ones and even the lives we once lived. A final focus is placed on the impact that mental health policy plays in meeting our needs and what must change so that we can all thrive regardless of the challenges we face. Thanks for joining us. Up first, your weekly healthspiration, a moment to reflect on the bigger picture. I'm Tom Kasumpas, President and CEO of the National Partnership for Healthcare and Hospice Innovation and founder of Healthsperian. The passing of someone we love is one of the most sobering events any one of us will face in our lives. The pain we feel is a realization that our world has changed. Our reality has altered, yet the memories, the past of the past stay with us, bringing feelings of both joy yet longing. As it relates to healthcare, compounding our grief is the all too often experience at the end of life where our healthcare system lacks clear direction in providing advanced care planning, supports for caregivers, and real empathy for choices of patients as they pass. New policies and reforms can change this, and I vow to continue my work and my colleagues' decades-long work to ensure that becomes a reality. Yet grief comes in many forms. We are in unprecedented times of loss loss of jobs and financial stability, loss of normalcy and daily routine, loss of belonging in a polarized nation, and historic loss of voice and autonomy felt by too many minority Americans. While many reforms are needed to combat these issues, there is no reason that we can't do this together. An inevitable truth is that we are all in this together. All of us face death and grieving, and therefore all of us can take solace and support in our shared humanity. I invite you to join us in the fight on this front. Now join Healthsperian policy experts and friends for Stay in the Know, a weekly policy segment on the top health policy issues we're facing this week. This is Andrew McPherson, Managing Partner at Healthsperian here in Washington, D.C., and this is Stay in the Know. This week's segment, which explores grief and loss during the COVID-19 pandemic, is particularly important and special to me. On Mother's Day just last month, after speaking to my mom early in the morning, she called me back in the afternoon to tell me my Uncle Jeff had died. Not of COVID-19, but of a sudden illness. My family and I were devastated and still carry the grief with us every day. Important questions presented themselves. How does one grieve during a pandemic when millions are following stay-at-home orders? How would my family find new ways to honor Uncle Jeff, his life, his many accomplishments, and especially that larger-than-life personality? How would we manage this incredible loss while staying safe? These questions raised larger questions, not just for me and my family, but for us all. How are we as a community, as a country, grieving and experience the immense loss of life, the loss of our previous daily lives, of employment, and of our sense of social connectedness? These are tough questions, and today I am so thankful to be able to discuss them with two extraordinary national leaders on grief and loss, my dear friends, Dr. B.J. Miller and Dr. Shoshana Ungerleader. B.J. Miller is a palliative care physician at the University of California, San Francisco Medical Center, and also serves on the teaching faculty at UCSF School of Medicine. B.J. is the founder of Metal Health, an online palliative care counseling startup, and was formerly 
the executive director of San Francisco's Zen Hospice Project. An accomplished author and speaker with deep expertise in symptom management for patients, BJ is the author of A Beginner's Guide to the End with Shoshana Berger and was the subject of the Netflix Academy Award-nominated film Endgame. You may have seen his 2015 TED Talk that now has almost 11 million views. And also my good friend, Dr. Shoshana Ungerleiter. Shoshana is the founder of endwellproject.org, a practicing internist, writer, and leading voice in healthcare who regularly speaks as medical contributor on CNN, MSNBC, CBS News with bylines in Time, Scientific American, the San Francisco Chronicle, Vox, and many others. She executive produced two Netflix Oscar-nominated documentaries, Extremis and Endgame. Welcome, Shoshana and BJ. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Andrew. So I want to start with talking about how we think about grief, how we define grief. It's been now 50 years since Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross published On Death and Dying, where she talked about grief in five steps. BJ, can you talk about what grief is today? Does that definition still stand? And how does that relate to the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, grief's an ancient thing. Our ideas of what the heck it is and how to describe it may have shifted. It's very much the same beast. It's inherently a squirrely thing. It, you know, it shape shifts and it has proxies. So for some folks, it, or for some moments, it might present as anger or bargaining or all the things that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross pointed out, and then some. It can feel like it's surreal. It can feel like you're underwater or sort of wrapped in saran wrap, some barrier between you and the world. So I don't know that the sensations have changed much. Our ways of describing it or appreciate it certainly have. I think what's happening now that may be relatively new is, and maybe this is wishful thinking, but I think the world or the Western world may be ready to lean into grief a little bit more, make space for it. I think a lot of us have absorbed from social cues that if to grieve well means to grieve quickly and to get back on the horse and move on. And I've certainly fallen into that trap. But I think now, perhaps with this existential crisis on mass, maybe we're all willing to lean into grief a little bit more and to roll with it and give ourselves more than a week or two to deal with it. And th- at least that's my hope. And it feels that way. It feels like a less exotic of a concept. Shoshana, you've talked about the fact that we don't even have the language really to describe the type of grief that we're experiencing today. Talk a little bit more about that. Just to echo what BJ had to say about these five stages, I think that it's sort of a helpful framework to think about grief because it might help someone to understand and then put in context where they might be falling within those five stages. But I think to me, as I've been learning, the key takeaway is that the grief experience is as unique as we all are. So the idea that you you shouldn't have to feel like you have to go through each of them or that there's some order. There's no right or wrong way to to grieve. And it's highly individualized and, of course, unpredictable and messy. In the current context of the pandemic, I think all of us are grieving now, even for those of us that haven't lost a loved one or won't lose someone that we love. I think we're experiencing what we're calling this collective grief. And these are feelings of loss that are brought on by the loss of so many elements of the life that we've known. So even losing a job or, you know, not getting to see your child graduate, having the unpredictability of daily life. I think that we're grieving the loss of a life that we once knew and what we thought the future was going to hold for us. And then this whole idea of anticipatory grief is this feeling that we get about what the future holds when we're uncertain about it. And I think that's a lot of what many, many people are are feeling right now. I think about that sort of collective feeling of loss and, and grief that we're feeling as individuals, as communities, this country globally. BJ, is there something soothing about that, that we're all going through something together, that we're all experiencing this like extraordinary loss. Talk about the global grief that we're all experiencing. Yeah, I think there's a couple of points to make. I think it is a shared experience right now. It's 
scale and on mass, as we say, and that in some ways amplifies the experience. It's everywhere. Even if you could put your own grief down for a moment, you'll find you'll run into somebody else's. You know, it's so it's boggy and wild and everywhere. And that's in some ways harder just because of the scale of it and the inescapability of it. And I also think that there's something really potentially wonderful about it because I think these folks that I've worked with, one of the ways grief can get so extra hard is you feel so alone. And you very often are. We haven't respected grief. We don't give each other the right amount of space around, et cetera. But now maybe that's different. Now maybe there's more access to empathy. And maybe now the isolation that tends to come with grief, maybe that's a little bit lessened because we know our neighbors are going through it too. That again, is sort of theoretical. We'll see how this goes. We're still relatively fresh. But that I think is both the, the challenge here and the opportunity of this collective grief. Shoshana, what do you think about collective grief and this mysterious and also just unbelievably, in many ways, painful experience that we're all going through together? Gosh, I mean, so many things to say. I agree with BJ. I mean, it's this very intense experience that, yes, it's incredibly hard and everywhere. And like I said earlier, it was just very messy in terms of your people's day-to-day sort of feelings and emotions and trying to wade through it in a way that nobody was right prepared for. I think that there are ways that we can come together in the shared understanding that this is such a tough time for everybody, whether you've lost someone that you love or you've lost your job. There are just so many changes, I think, that we're all going through. And then the fact that the future remains largely uncertain. Anybody who tells you right now that they know what six months or 12 months or even four years from now is going to look like, they're lying because nobody does. So we're sort of sitting in that uncertainty together. It's just really challenging, but maybe if we can reframe it, it maybe it's a place for growth and connection. Yeah, that's something we think about a lot here, I think, in Washington and a range of communities that we work with, you know, mental and behavioral health, for example, the hospice community, and others is, and you touched on it, Shoshana, in your op-ed in Scientific American, this notion of the long-term consequences of the experience that we're having right now. Talk a little bit about the long-term and, and where, you know, if you looked out a year or two years down the road, it's hard to do, but I think it's important to think about where we're collectively going as we sort of grieve this really challenging moment. Again, I don't know that we know what the long-term consequences are going to be for sure, there is a sort of collective toll that this will take on on our mental health, on our emotional well-being, even our physical health, right? Because all those things are actually very much intertwined. I think that absolutely when we don't recognize and name how we're individually feeling, how things are occurring at a societal level, there are potentially really detrimental effects. And so I think that the more that we continue to normalize this experience of grief, to to really talk about it, and again, kind of name some of these emotions that come up for people, it can be really powerful. I mean, I think there's so many other things that we could talk about in terms of what individuals can be doing in, in order to get the help and support that they need, and whether it's talking to a professional, so creating some kind of you know therapeutic relationship with a therapist, whether it's just those of us taking a, a pause out of our busy days to reach out to someone that we love over text and say, hey, sure. I'm just thinking about you. It takes a minute and it really does make a big difference. So I think there are definitely things that we can be doing to help one another and hopefully avoid some long-term really negative consequences down the road of, of this whole experience. I certainly experienced that with the grief that I've been feeling following the loss of my Uncle Jeff last month. Our family is a family of gatherers. You know, we ritualistically get together as much as we can. We hug, we laugh, we're loud, and we weren't able to do much of that, unfortunately. And so we haven't had that closure, which has been really challenging. BJ, talk a little bit about, you know, how we can still find closure as we grieve as COVID-19 continues. How do we get that closure? And what are some of your reflections on that? Well, I think one thing to realize, or at least in my take on things here, I don't, I don't mean to present it as a fact, but my sense is that closure is always sort of a made up thing. There is no natural closure besides the death itself, birth right. and the death. 
So I think it's helpful for us to realize where, because it does feel like the world is different now and, and, and so unfamiliar, but maybe it's helpful to find perspective where things really haven't changed. And one of the ways, so the details of how we make meaning, how we script the narrative for our experience and move on and live with it, et cetera, the mechanics are much the same. So one thing to be clear on is it may feel like we're being robbed of an experience by not being able to be together. And as you say, it seems to undermine the potential for closure. I guess, again, I would say it's helpful to realize that closure is a made up convention yeah. and it's always up to us to create that closure mm -hmm. and creating closure always has something to do with reconciling things that we can't control all the things that were out of our control. And now with this sort of forced isolation, well, that's the big thing, but it's one more thing on the pile of stuff we can't control. So I guess I'd point us all back to ourselves to find the agency to create that closure because that's how it's always been. That I think is personally my big takeaway. That's a script for us to write. And it may be that we defer some of the memorials or some of the shared activity and we plan for big parties down the road. I think maybe many of us have been to memorials that are a year or two after the death and not immediately following the death. We can still look forward to that. Along the way, thinking of closure as a creative process, well, we should all be taking notes while how we're feeling, what's lighting up for us now, what's falling away for us now. That's the raw material that we're going to find this, we're going to create the meaning from. And then when we're ready to get together again, we'll have so much to reflect upon besides the death per se. So that would be my hope, to stick to mm -hmm. the basic tenets of meaning making. The process has not changed, the raw material has changed, but we can still own that process. EJ, you're, you're so good and so wise, man. The one thing I would yeah. add to that is that for folks who are inclined to look for a more acute or uh, in, in the near term coming together around shared community. I think there are a number of really interesting online platforms that have really come about. They've been around for a while, but now I think have been spotlighted because of COVID and the intentional kind of physical distancing that we have to do to stay safe. And so there are a number of really thoughtful entrepreneurs who have created these platforms where people can come together virtually and either create stream funeral experience or, you know, use something like uh, Zoom to really find community through the webs and tubes of the internet. So there are ways to do that. Our family at least has found that the Zoom is uh, extraordinary to be able to look at each other and laugh, but we got a hug. <laughs> you know, we're a family of huggers. So that's really interesting. And can I just jump in on that as we yeah. kind of build on each other here? Amen, Shosha. What Shosha's saying, I mean, there are new things happening. Technology is making all sorts of stuff possible here. As you're saying, Andrew, I think the trick is to not confuse the technology, the sort of online memorials, et cetera, wonderful. But we shouldn't necessarily confuse ourselves with that's the same thing as being in person to each, with each other. So if you don't caveat it that way, then I think a lot of those things can leave you feeling hollow because they're not adding up to your expectations. So I think one of the ways through all of this is to let ourselves be changed, let new things happen. Yes, because they're happening. So just to be a little careful that, that it is different. A Zoom conversation is not the same thing as looking into the eyes or touching the person. And I think if you can keep that clear, that online stuff is wonderful, and it'll also make the analog stuff when we're all together extra poignant, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. BJ, I want to dig in on that a little bit more and talk just about, talk about the role of palliative care specifically and with grief and loss and as a palliative care physician and what types of resources we should be thinking about in communities across the country, across the world to access those supportive care? As we know, palliative care as a field, as a discipline, you know, on paper has always said that our work doesn't end with the death, you know, that we are here for families through grief as well, that our work continues on with the families after death. Yeah, and hospice is certainly as part of palliative care uh, have been doing that for years. But I think we also need to be honest that that grief work has not been financially supported and very often it basically amounts to a pamphlet and maybe a phone call. Yes, grief is part of our purview as a profession, but honestly, I think there has been for a long time a lot for us to develop in this grief sphere. I would point us back, so palliative care is, uh, is super relevant here, 
but I think we're all kind of learning too. So I don't think we're holding on to some secret that the world needs right now around, around grief. I think we're all figuring this out together. But I think for any listener, we should also realize that as a resource, when we need a little help, that our local hospice agencies and our palliative care teams should be a resource for us to call upon. They should be able to answer the call, have a conversation, et cetera. They should be able to tend to some of this work. So I'd point all of us, anyone who's in need, uh, call your local hospice agency, for example. Now, beyond that, I'd point us back to what Shosh is saying. There's a lot going online. For example, Reimagine is a nonprofit that we all know about that's sort of bringing end of life and culture together. They've been yep. doing monthly vigils that I think a lot of people have been finding very powerful online. There are other uh, folks doing similarly. Claire Bidwell-Smith, a friend of Shoshana's and mine, is doing Mm -hmm. online grief work. Also, just reaching out to various online psychotherapy outlets. Let's not pathologize this. You don't need to be depressed to benefit from talking with a, a, a psychologist or a therapist. There's a lot of help at the ready is through these outlets and probably more and chime in if I'm missing a few here, but those are some basic ideas. And then one more thing to point out is, you know, we are become more secularized, but a lot of us, even though we may be atheists or agnostic, a lot of us grew up with faith traditions. And I'd be interesting to see if many of us, this is a great moment. Grief is a wonderful moment to return to longstanding traditions in the spiritual community Every major religion has something to say about grief and rituals to lend to it, to give it structure. And so this may be a really wonderful time for a lot of us to be revisiting our faith roots or to find new ones. I would say a lot of clergy have wonderful training in in grief and bereavement support, too. I often forget that, but like many, many rabbis I know are, are just amazing to talk to, even for a short conversation about something that you're going through like this. There's also a number of cool apps out there. So entrepreneurs are creating products that are specifically grief focused. One, for example, Grief Coach. So it's an app that texts you resources and tips all year long to help you kind of feel less alone. And then if your friends want to help, we've all had friends that we want to reach out to, but we don't know how. They text them suggestions about how to connect if you can't find the words. Bill, I should probably, now's a good time for me to just mention this thing that I'm starting up, which is Metal Health, uh, M-E-T-T-L-E, and metalhealth.com. And it should be live within, by the end of the month. But we'll be doing online grief counseling ourselves as well. So it's just another in a long line of telehealth options. And BJ, you brought up earlier this notion of how important connectedness is. And Shoshana, you mentioned it as well, to the grieving process and knowing that you're not alone. Talk a little bit more about that, BJ. And you know these tools that we have, you said the technology is helpful, but doesn't replace maybe an in-person connection to have with somebody. But talk a little bit about maintaining that connectedness and social connection during this time of physical distancing and the importance of that? I think we've covered, and of course, through telephone, through email, through Zoom and GoToMeeting, et cetera, the sort of video conferencing platforms, these group activities that we've also mentioned, those are wonderful ways to stay connected to fellow humans. Some of us respond, actually just have come to love text. And as Josh mentioned earlier, just sending out a text to someone, hey, I'm thinking of you, can go a long way. You can feel so out to sea. And to know that there's actually someone in the sea with you is really, really helpful. And it doesn't need to be much. You don't need to find the perfect thing to say. And in fact, there really isn't a perfect thing to say. So just say something or just even feel something. But where I'd, I'd like to point us to is maybe through all this isolation, we'll also kind of realize we'll also find our way to developing our own internal worlds. And that's where the connection actually is felt. You know, the relationships certainly are material, but the relationship, the dynamic, so much of that is inside of us in our psychology, our psyche, our emotional worlds. So for each of us, this is one of the reasons I love calling out grief and because that allows us to give it some space and not try to force ourselves into anything. So right now in terms of connection, I think connecting to ourselves, connecting to the natural world, going outside, finding something in common with a tree, you know, just connecting to nature. It doesn't have to be human to human. I think connection of any kind can help. So uh, while we may be isolated from each other, we're not isolated from Mother Nature. We're not isolated from our pets. We're not isolated from our minds. 
And I would go there. I would go let ourselves go inward. I lost my sister 20 years ago, but she's inside me. I still have a relationship with her inside of myself. And the more breath I give that relationship, i.e. my inner life with her, the more connected I feel with her, even 20 years down the road. That's actually where so much of the rubber meets the road. And I would point us all there. Yeah, I had this image in my mind when my Uncle Jeff passed just immediately of my grandmother, his mother sort of guiding him into whatever is next, if there is something next. And it was really a, just an image in my mind that helped me in the moment yeah. to, to sort of hold and initially manage what I was feeling in, in those early moments of the grief. Yeah, no, so useful. You know, that reminds me of a beloved dog. I had a service dog after my injuries years ago for 11 years. This dog and I were together 24 hours a day, you know, and his name was Vermont. And after he died, I found myself just anytime I lost a patient or a friend or someone close at all, I had this image of Vermont, the dog would come flying through the air and pick up this person who's, who had just passed, throw them on his back. And with this tongue hanging out of his mouth with this big grin on his face, just take the person flying around and meet the person. And it may sound silly. I don't know what it sounds like to anybody else. I've used that imagery hundreds, if not thousands of times, and it soothes me every time. And it actually feels like I'm doing something for the person, certainly for myself. Well, as a sixth generation Vermonter, I'm, I'm right there with you. <laughs> Shoshana, I want to shift gears a little bit as we conclude together. Thank you. This has been really, really interesting and helpful. I want to talk about the future with respect to policymaking. There's not enough of a palliative care workforce right now to support people who are experiencing serious illness, to support grief and loss. Here in Washington, we've spent over $4 trillion now to address the national emergency. There's likely more to come. What is your advice to policymakers, to the Trump administration, to the Congress on what we should be focused on to support people who are experiencing grief? Wow. Yeah. I think there's so many different ways to go. And I'm definitely not a policy expert. I leave that <laughs> to you all. But absolutely, as you already pointed out, you know, we have a massive workforce shortage in terms of folks that are trained in palliative care, whether specialty trained, meaning, you know, after residency doing fellowship, or even primary palliative care, meaning those of us like me on sort of more on the front lines of healthcare as generalists, having education and training throughout our medical school and our residency years in, in sort of palliative care fundamentals, communication skills training, I think being the top thing that is really stands out for me, um, that's, that's very much lacking. And I think the funding and we really need to recognize that this is truly an issue that deserves our attention here. I think in terms of thinking spe more specifically about grief, I would say that recognize, I would encourage our federal leaders to recognize that the entire country is mourning and to call it out and to name it and to create space for national mourning, even just to say what's happening here, which hasn't been done. I think this is critical clearly have not seen it from the current administration. And it's a real issue. So I would say those things, I mean, I'm sure there are, are a million other things we could come up with, but those are top of mind for me. And BJ, you touched on bereavement and lack of reimbursement, lack of resources there. What's your recommendation to the mm -hmm. Congress and to the administration? So let's see here. So in general terms, maybe now finally the country's eyes are open to what exactly palliative care is and the need uh -huh. for support when we're dealing with something that can't be fixed. So maybe there's a new appetite to revisit existing proposals around uh, beefing up palliative care training and uh, overhauling medical education in general. And then I think within the hospice benefit, for example, or any new benefits that come along, Amen shows just the point of calling out grief and naming it and maybe revisiting policy reimbursement around grief counseling so that there actually are reimbursement streams for it. I think just naming that grief is something that it lingers more than two weeks, which whatever the DSM-5 might tell us right now, it sort of depathologize the situation. So those are some ideas. It's a great time to revisit FMLA, Family Medical Leave Act, too. It would be a great time for HR companies to think about including in benefit packages, a generous time away or grief support, you know, a certain number of visits of support with a counselor. 
those kinds of things could go a long way. We've needed them before. We really need them now. And then beyond that, my mind goes to whoever's in that White House soon. I hopefully, if we shortchange this mourning period and force ourselves to ram a smile back on our face too soon, we're going to go backwards even more spectacularly. And we're going to either numb out or get more violent with ourselves and each other. So A, naming it, extending the period. It's not just a couple of weeks and memorializing it. I could imagine a lot of funding going to public art programs and public art projects right now mm-hmm. to have public art commemorating what's happened and what is happening. Then we've sewn this experience into the fabric that normalizes it. We feel less alone. Down the road, we can touch something that reminds us of what we went through together, et cetera. And this is the way we'll turn this from just pure misery and tragedy into something from which we learned a great deal and actually advanced as a society. Maybe that sounds unrealistic, but I don't think it is at all. In fact, I think it's absolutely necessary. Otherwise, we're going to go backwards. Well, look, my good friends, Dr. B.J. Miller, palliative care physician at the University of California, San Francisco, and co-author of A Beginner's Guide to the End, and Dr. Shoshana Ungerleiter, founder of Endwell. Thank you so much for joining us today. And here is our industry foresight. Hello, I'm Jean Dessa, Senior Partner at HealthSperian and President of HealthSperian X here in Washington, D.C., and this is Industry Foresights. We just heard an extraordinary conversation between Dr. B.J. Miller and Dr. Shoshana Ungerleiter about grief and loss during COVID-19. Importantly, we recognize that grief and loss are not just related to loss of life as a result of the pandemic, but also the loss of life as we know it, of employment of connectiveness. Here at HealthSperian, we've been thinking about these issues from a broader perspective on the long-term care population and for those individuals caring for them. Particularly as communities across the country start emerging from lockdown and begin an uneven path to economic recovery, we're really going to need to start focusing on the health of seniors, those in long-term care, those with advanced illness. And we're spending a lot of time at HealthSperian thinking about potential innovations, places where society, policymakers, stakeholders across the healthcare system can start really thinking about in a meaningful way, what is innovation in long-term care? What do we need to do? How do we need to resource it? The issues that we're going to be focusing on at HealthSperian as we consider the challenges of innovation in long-term care are multifactorial. We are looking at enhanced processes that can prevent and detect and respond to crises in nursing facilities and long-term care arrangements in the home. We're looking also at advances in facility design. How can we design and structure the places that our seniors are going or to spend their end of life that are more comfortable for them and their family to go through the challenges of advanced illness at the end of life. We're looking at approaches that we can use to build a more capable, connected, and flexible workforce that can react to a situation like the pandemic and also be able to address the needs of individuals with advanced illness in long-term care facilities. It'll be really important to develop and finance systems of care that allow older individuals to stay in their homes where possible. But to the extent they can't, we also need to figure out ways to design financial models that incentivize and reward the kinds of care that people need at the end of life. Certainly, and as discussed throughout this podcast, advanced care planning and strategies that can help families engage with their relatives in a crisis are going to be really important. And there's a lot of new technologies and tools that can make this kind of planning process and engagement more accessible and flexible. And finally, we always come back to the need to address social isolation with the elderly, efforts to physically isolate seniors, such as preventing loved ones from visiting them in facilities to protect them from disease transmission. At the end of life, can cause major problems for families and lead to the grieving challenges that we discussed in this podcast. Thank you very much. And we'll be spending a lot more time at HealthSperian in 
building out practical, scalable solutions in these areas. Here's our health policy breakdown. Hello, everyone. My name is Melissa McHale, and I'm a health policy analyst at Healthspirian. Today, I will be having a discussion on mental health policy with Scott Barstow. He is the Senior Director of Congressional and Federal Affairs at the American Psychological Association Services Incorporated, and he works on policy issues affecting the practice of psychology and access to mental health and substance use disorder services. So, Scott, I'm going to start with some of the obvious things. On this episode, we've been talking about grief in the era of COVID-19, and it's important to note that we can't talk about grieving without talking about the current state of grief, without also unveiling the current issues with access to mental health services in the healthcare industry. Even as far back as 2012, the Institute of Medicine had a report focused on mental health services access for older Americans, and they concluded that there's probably never going to be enough mental health specialists in the U.S. to meet the need for care. And it seems pretty clear from the research that the need for services is going to ramp up even higher with the COVID pandemic. And we know that even before all this stuff started happening, Psychiatrists had the lowest Medicare participation rate of any physician specialty. Psychologists have a low participation rate. There's going to be some changes that need to be made to try and get more people in to see mental health specialists. Some of the unprecedented regulatory flexibilities that CMS has granted providers for the purpose of tackling this pandemic During COVID-19, we've seen a lot of new flexibilities, most notably significant ones regarding telehealth. Can you talk about how these telehealth flexibilities have changed mental health care delivery? I'd be happy to. I think this is probably the primary way that the whole COVID-19 pandemic and the response to it is going to be changing the healthcare system. And it's been dramatic. We have psychologists who a year or two ago or even just a few months ago maybe had something like 10% or less of their clients that they were providing services to via telehealth. And now for a lot of them, it's up at or near 100%. So it's a huge, huge change. The needle will probably move back once the current crisis is over, but I don't think we're going to go back to the way things looked last year. Yeah, definitely. I think it's fair to say that these flexibilities have kind of been a Pandora box, if you will. We can't really go back to the way we were pre-COVID in that regard. Do you mind touching a little bit more on what specific flexibilities have been the most paramount within telehealth and also just other flexibilities in general? What would you say have been the most significant in terms of the evolution of mental health services? There have been a few of them, and all of this has happened within the last three months or so. It's hard for me to pick one of them. Initially, one of the first steps was that CMS said, okay, we're going to get rid of the originating site and distant site requirements so that you can see Medicare patients more generally, even if they're not in health professional shortage area. But At first, it was just for existing patients. So if you wanted to start Mm -hmm. seeing a new patient, you still had to see them in person. Then that requirement got removed so that you could see both existing and new patients. Then subsequently, after passage of the CARES Act, it, it opened up even more. And at this point, you can see Medicare patients in their homes, regardless of whether or not they're in a health professional shortage area. They can be new patients. You can see them for pretty much any service that a psychologist provides. And you can provide services by audio only telephone. So the gloves are completely off right now, which is great for a lot of people because there have been significant roadblocks for Medicare beneficiaries getting access to telehealth services under the old requirement. It had to be through audiovisual equipment. We've had some really heart-wrenching stories from psychologists about 
Medicare patients who are in a hospital that they work in, and the hospital doesn't have staff around to come in and fire up an iPad and hold it for them and show them how to use it and do that sort of thing. So audio-only coverage is something that APA and a lot of other organizations and members of Congress have have wanted to um, have happened for a while as this whole debate really fired up, and we're there now. We're very happy about that and are hopeful that we can hang on to a lot of these extensions going forward, even after the emergency ends. We just had a couple other things. One is, obviously, there's the issue of whether or not people have access to reliable broadband services, which you typically need for effective audiovisual telehealth services. There's also the issue that older Americans tend to be less comfortable using IT services for healthcare purposes than other demographic groups. And even before all this stuff started, even before COVID became the the pandemic that it is, most of the principal diagnoses that Medicare beneficiaries had for receiving telehealth services were behavioral in nature. This is and can be a real game changer what's going on right now. Yeah, definitely. And I think we can both agree that there's definitely been some big accomplishments here with these new flexibilities, having more providers available for people if they haven't seen them before, and also audio-only telehealth, as you just mentioned. Our nation is grieving right now, essentially. Can you explain how these flexibilities may help make mental health services more accessible for Americans who are grieving? Or on the flip side, talk about how there may still need to be more work done to make this available for people who are grieving right now. I think it's going to take more work. Having access to a psychologist, clinical social worker, or other therapist, there are a lot of different factors involved in whether or not someone gets the help they need. And one of them, obviously, is stigma. Yeah. So if someone feels like, oh, they're not supposed to actually need someone to help them with a mental disorder or emotional problems that they're having. They wouldn't seek out someone in person or on the phone um, either way. The fact that you're seeing a lot of stories about the fact that the physical distancing that's going on is impacting everyone is hopefully normalizing accessing mental health services and making it clear that, look, everyone is struggling here. And I'll be curious to see what happens with rates of mental health service use 2019 to 2020, 2021, and see if that bends the curve. I'm just thinking about, as you'd mentioned previously, some older people who may not be the most comfortable with telehealth and who may also consequently be going through a lot of grieving, seeing family and friends being affected, not only by this virus, but like a lot of other things that are happening in our nation right now. What are some ways that we can address disparities among the elderly community as they grapple with mental health? And is there a policy answer for that? Or is it Um, back to culture? It's a all of the above type situation. So Yeah. yeah, there are cultural factors involved. There's the stigma that I mentioned. But there are definitely some policy issues involved as well. We are advocating for extending the current telehealth coverage expansions and flexibilities for at least a year beyond the end of the public health emergency to allow time for data collection and analysis and and consideration of how much of those we want to maintain permanently or more long-term after the emergency ends. So that's one aspect of access. One that hasn't gotten as much attention as telehealth expansions is just Medicare reimbursement rates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one of the things that a lot of healthcare policy people on Capitol Hill are talking about, I'm not sure the extent to which it's more widely known outside of the district, but Medicare changes, CMS's changes in reimbursement rates for Part B providers. Services that are known as evaluation and management services or EM services that physicians provide. And it accounts for something like 40% or so of what physicians bill Medicare for. Those codes are being reevaluated. And under the methodology that CMS is planning on using, EM 
code reimbursement rates would go up, which yeah. would be great if you're a general physician or a family physician. The downside, though, is that the way reimbursement rates are structured, the total pot of money it has to be budget neutral. So if payments for EM services go up, they've got to go down somewhere else. And CMS has projected that the changes that they are thinking about making would result in psychologist reimbursement rates being cut around 7% or so in 2021 if they don't change or tweak how exactly they crunch the numbers. And obviously that would have a big impact on the interest level of not just psychologists, but also clinical social workers in devoting a significant part of their practice to seeing Medicare beneficiaries. So if you're concerned about Medicare beneficiaries' access to behavioral health services, this is something that you'd want to pay attention to. There are are definitely some in-the-weeds type policy issues that will make a difference on the accessibility of mental health services. Wow, that's definitely interesting. So what you're saying is that essentially mental health professionals may be somewhat disincentivized to extend their services to the Medicare population. Correct. Yes. That actually segues really well into my next topic, which was mental health and substance use disorder parity. We know that this has been an ongoing policy issue within the healthcare space. And just for our listeners, for context, parity refers to having equal insurance coverage for mental health services as you would for medical or surgical services. So if I have diabetes and I am going to the doctor and getting medications to treat that, and I have a set of coverage for that. I should have an equal insurance coverage for, say, if I have depression or anxiety, I should have parity with my insurance coverage so that it is accommodating for me to get services for mental health or substance use disorder. So with that, I also wanted to just say that the lack of parity has resulted in more barriers for people to have affordable access to mental health. And I mentioned this to you earlier that in 2017, Milliman did a study that found consumers are significantly more likely to use out-of-network provider care at a substantially higher proportion for mental health services than they did for medical surgical care, even if their insurance provider did have mental health parity. So I was just wondering if you can touch on some of the ways that these flexibilities that we had discussed would be a potential relief for parity? That's an interesting question. I would say that theoretically, at least, yeah, if you've got the ability to see a provider who is maybe in another state that a family member had a good experience with or a friend referred you to, and you were able to have that service covered, perhaps that would result in more effective treatment but that would assume that your health plan would cover that. So mental health parity implementation is one of those places where, again, the devil is in the details. And not everyone is doing exactly what Medicare is doing with telehealth services coverage. Some health plans are adopting the telehealth coverage expansions. Some of them were doing that even before Medicare started doing this because they saw the cost-effectiveness of doing that. Medicaid programs vary as well. So with mental health parity specifically, the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, it's a really, really thorny issue. So some aspects of trying to establish parity are relatively straightforward. If you're talking about quantitative treatment limits, the problem is that it's really easy for health plans to use non-quantitative treatment limits simply having a certain set of providers who are on their network panel for internal medicine, for example. And then when it comes to mental health treatment, having a really, really restricted panel with maybe a tenth or a fifth of the number of providers that you would naturally expect, or you know, maybe they're not that accessible geographically. Maybe it's a two-month wait to get an office visit with them or a telehealth consult visit with them. So the non-quantitative treatment limits 
the, the ability of plants to decide who's going to be on their panel, how much they're going to be paying them, are really where the rubber meets the road. And the problem is that enforcement is, no pun intended, all over the map because you've got state insurance commissioners. In some cases, you've got state attorneys general who are getting involved, which can be great. You've got HHS. You've got the Department of Labor. It's not really a situation where the average person who, let's say they've got clinical depression, they're trying to get covered for services, and their health plan denies a claim or says, right, well, yeah, we'll cover that, but we don't think you need quite as many sessions as your therapist does or whatever. It's not really going to be the first thing the patient thinks of to pick up the phone and say, all right, well, I need to find the Department of Labor to try and see whether or not my health plan is actually meeting the parity requirements. But in a lot of cases, it's the Department of Labor that would be the enforcing entity. So the Government Accountability Office came out with a report in December of last year. and I remember the report. Basically, for for our listeners, what the GAO had found was that federal enforcement and oversight of mental health parity at the state and federal level, the GAO concluded that that oversight and enforcement was inconsistent. Prior to when plans made it to the market, they found, of course, that that oversight was there. But after the fact, when these plans were being given to consumers for enrollment, And consumers would say, hey, I'm having issues with my mental health services having parity. That was the issue at hand, was that there was an inability to have consistent oversight at the state and federal level. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done. And there's the Mental Health Parity Compliance Act. And it was introduced in the Senate by Senators Murphy and Cassidy and in the House by Congresswoman Katie Porter and Congressman Gus Belarakis and Don Norcross that would try and and beef that up and add a lot of reporting requirements on non-quantitative treatment limits and strengthen the hand of the federal agencies and make sure that they've got a lot of this information as a matter of course. But to get back to the fact that there are a lot of different hands in the in the pie, so to speak. Yeah. The bill's like 24 pages long, but only because it takes repeating the same seven pages or so of text and adding it to ERISA, to the Internal Revenue Code, and to the Public Health Service Act. So we've talked a lot about what the government, vis-a-vis CMS, Department of Labor, HHS, what their role is in providing more accessibility and relief for mental health. I just want to touch back on grief. How are mental health providers dealing with these uncertain times and helping people with grief? And what would you say have been kind of the best recommendations to people who need help and are grieving may not necessarily have like an existing mental health condition where they're already seeking mental health services But for those people who generally don't have issues and are currently dealing with grief, what would you recommend as kind of the best course of action? First and foremost, I would just suggest that they try to find someone to talk to, whether it's a psychologist or some other type of therapist, because there are a lot of people who, with the stress and grief, and loneliness and isolation, maybe before COVID hit, they were struggling with some personal issues or difficulties, but as a result of what they're going through now, may actually meet clinical criteria for depression or anxiety, some sort of disorder like that. So you can still see a therapist and explore that and just get their vantage point and their help. And that's better than assuming you don't and not actually asking for help or trying to find someone you can talk to. I think with mental health care, more so than other types of care, the rapport with the individual provider, I think is crucial. So Don't be afraid of trying more than one therapist. Have a phone consultation or Zoom meeting or something like that with one therapist and it it doesn't really seem to click for you and you're still feeling really down and isolated and stressed out. 
try and find someone else. It's self-care is definitely important. Thank you for this, Scott. This is very informative and I appreciate you being on the show today. My pleasure. That concludes our episode for this week. Thank you for tuning in. If you have any questions on anything you heard on this week's episode, please head over to healthsperian.com for more information and deeper analysis. And as always, tune in next week for more health policy insights and discussion.